We are in our session for tonight. I am recording this for you ahead of time so that we can uh, accommodate the time while I'm away. And I am, this, is a ca this topic is one that you can file under the category of miscellaneous. Uh, don't really have, we're not part of a series. It's just something that I've gotten involved in, uh, a topic that um, deserves much more attention than I can give it in one message. Uh, but something I've been thinking about all through the month of January. So I thought that I would uh, use it as a sort of filler for in between what we're doing now and uh, what we've been doing, Second Peter, and what we're going to be doing in the weeks to come. So the topic is Jesus the King. Uh, in January, as you know, we, I promote Bible reading. And uh, I just, I've got, had various methods that we've used throughout the years. Uh, different ones that I've tried, and uh, one that I uh, have done in the past, and I wanted to go back to it for just the first month of the year, was this intense Bible reading schedule that where you read through the whole New Testament in a month, and there's, a, there's an accompanying uh, strategy where you can read through the Old Testament in three months, and, and it's very intense. You, you have to really commit yourself to reading a lot of Scripture all at once, but one of the ways that I do it is I'm always looking for a topic as I read through those sessions. I'm not reading for details. I'm looking for topics or a certain topic. Try to p collect all the verses on a particular topic. And I find that is quite an interesting exercise as I do it. Now, uh, so I was going through this uh, topic, Jesus is King. What I mean by that topic is I was looking for verses that where, where Jesus was declared to be King. And um, uh, throughout the New Testament. And this will come in various forms. Some are more direct than others. I was looking for the most direct statements that would say Jesus is king. Now I have to admit that my, admit that my uh, determinations on this are subjective. There, I probably missed some passages. And there might be some that I've included that you might say, well, that's not really saying Jesus is king. And so it is a bit subjective. But tonight what I want to do is give a quick survey of my findings, then make some applications. And uh, uh, this, this will, be, uh, will not be complete, uh, as well as being subjective, but there are actually, in this study, I found some, several startling things uh, as I went through, and it really spoke to me about what the message of the New Testament is regarding Jesus as king. So the first thing I want to talk about are the places where the most frequent re uh, references to Jesus is king. And I found that two books stood out over all the others as having many references to the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the Gospel of Matthew, which is not surprising, and the book of Revelation, and that, it's, that is also not surprising. The book of Matthew, we are told, is the, is the gospel to the Jews. It, they are very concerned with the Messiah. The Messiah is the king. And so it stands to reason that Matthew would present Jesus as the king, perhaps more than any other gospel. And in fact, that is what is true. I actually had sort of forgotten that, and I wasn't expecting it. And I thought, surely it will be mentioned in some of the other Gospels a little bit more than it is. But to my surprise, Matthew outshines them all when it comes to these kinds of references. And of course, Revelation is the consummation of the age. It is the time when Jesus is going to be sitting, uh, by the end of the book of Revelation, on David's throne for a thousand years. And so it would stand to reason that there would be references to Jesus as king in the book of Revelation. So what we want to do, if you will turn to the Gospel of Matthew to start out with. Now, I'm not going to be reading many of these verses. I'm just going to read a few. I'm going to read the few in the very beginning of Matthew, and I have some in John at the end that I'm going to read. Uh, but I, I'm going to just, I'm going to be rattling through references, and uh, hopefully this will not be too tedious as we go through. So let's start with the first one. Jesus, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now I've pointed out in the past how unique this genealogy is in that the oldest person in the genealogy is not mentioned first. In fact, you would, we would expect him to say 
the son of Abraham before he would say the son of David. But David is put in the prominent position because Matthew is presenting the son of David, David the king. And if you look down to verse 6, Jesse was the father of David the king. Now David is the only one in this line who is identified as a king. If you work your way through the list, He'll talk about Solomon, he'll talk about Rehoboam, he'll talk about Abijah, he'll talk about Asa, he'll talk about uh, Jehoshaphat, he'll talk about Joram, he'll talk about Uzziah, and Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah, and Manasseh, and Amon, and Josiah, and then Jeconiah and his brothers, and only David is mentioned as king. David is the father of the Messiah, the Davidic promise the Davidic covenant is the one that promises a king to sit on the throne forever. And so it is significant. Uh, it's not a direct reference, of course, when he says David the king, but it is, or it is, it is uh, connected to the theme. And so that's why I included it. And then the next reference is we find in chapter 2 and verse 2, where the Magi come to Herod and they say, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And that stirs Jerusalem up. But there is this expectation of the kingship. And we're going to go through. And as you can see. I've got no notes for you. I'm not going to go to each one. I've got certain ones I've highlighted. I encourage you to go through. And think about each of these passages. As you study this out later perhaps. But uh, notice for example. Number seven on the list. Are you the expected one? John the Baptist sends a question to Jesus. Are you the expected one? Are you the Messiah? John has identified him as the Messiah, but Jesus is not acting as a king. He's not setting up his kingdom. He's doing nothing about the Romans. He's leaving John in jail. And so John says, are, are you the expected one? I thought you were, are you? And so Jesus says, well, look what I you see. The lame walk, the blind see, the dead are raised to life, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And so he is doing exactly what the king was prophesied to do. He's telling John, yes, I am the king. Don't worry. Of course, that is a bit of an indirect reference, but I think it is one that we can count. Then in uh, chapter 19, going down to number 10, in the, he says, in the regeneration, the Son of Man will sit on his throne. He's, he's, he, the Son of Man is one of his favorite designations for himself. He says he will sit on his throne. He clearly expects to sit on a throne. He expects to be a king. Then he, the, the, his disciples believe that so much so that the mother of James and John comes in the next chapter and says, command that in your kingdom my sons will sit on the right hand and left. Now he, he, she is Mary's sister, the mother of James and John. And she is, uh, is so she's saying, they, uh, now, now Jesus, you know, listen to your auntie here now. I want you to, I want you to let your, my sons you know, to sit with you in your kingdom. She believes there's going to be a kingdom. So there's, there's another reference. Here's a very unique reference. And this one's important, so I want you to pay attention to this one. The blind man at the city of Jericho, as they're sitting there, and Jesus is coming by, and this is towards the end of the Lord's ministry, and they cry out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now that's a very important title. They know the covenants. They know that uh, that that. The son of David is going to come. He's going to rule forever. And they are calling on him to heal them. All right. Now we're, we want you to hold on to that one because we're going to come back to that idea a little bit later. Very important, very significant thing. The blind man can see who he is. The rest of Israel is blind. Now, uh, the, the other references I'm going to highlight here are that the end of his ministry, there's a couple other we're going to miss, so we'll skip over. But notice, at the trial, hereafter, he says to the Caiaphas, you will see the Son of Man on the right hand of power in the position of king. He is declaring himself to be the Messiah, the promised one, the Son of David, the king. And so this, of course, leads the chief priest to say, ah, oh, you know, off with his head. You know, basically, they're, they're, uh, they're calling for his overthrow. And then Pilate, are you the king? It is as you say, Jesus says, chapter 27, verse 11. The soldiers mock him. Hail, king of the Jews. Matthew 27, verse 30. Then they put up the placard. This is the king of the Jews. Matthew 27, verse 37. And the mockers coming by in Matthew 27, verse 41. If he is a king, let him come down. Right? Show himself. 
Okay, so this is the voice of unbelief, but it is a clear understanding of the term. They clearly understand what Jesus is claiming. They clearly understand uh, the expectation, and they are rejecting it, of course. All right, but there are these references. This is Matthew. Now, notice I count 21 references in Matthew, and that is by far the most of any New Testament book. There are also references in the book of Revelation. Jesus is presented as the ruler of the kings of the earth in chapter 1, verse 5. To him, there's a doxology, to him be the dominion forever in chapter 1, verse 6. Several other references as you work through the early chapters. In chapter 11, there's a declaration, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of Christ. Now, that is something that, that is yet future. This has not yet happened. Uh, and when he returns, chapter 19, there's three references on his head are many diadems, verse 12. He will rule them with a rod of iron, verse 15. On his, uh, on his thigh is embroidered in his garment. Uh, his name is written, King of Kings, uh, verse 16. And then it says that the saints are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years in chapter 20. It says that twice in verse 4 and verse 6. And uh, he, uh, then he closes the book by declaring, I am the root and descendant of David. He is declaring himself as the king. Now, from these you can see there are many references to Jesus as king in these two books. And most of them are quite direct. Uh, even though there are these ambiguous ones somewhat or, or somewhat nuanced ones, the, most of them are quite direct. Also, before we go on, I want to notice that most of the references speak of the kingdom and the throne as future. There is a sense that Jesus rules all things now. There is the universal aspect of the kingdom. Along with God, as God, Jesus rules all things. He's in control of all things. But that's not the idea that is presented when we think of Jesus as the king, the son of David. That is speaking about an earthly kingdom. And there is another sense in which Jesus rules over his people, the church. The spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Now, that is true. He does rule over the hearts of his people. But, and then some of those references you'll find here in the ones that we've covered. But the, the, the Jesus as the son of David, Jesus on the throne, Jesus as the king, is something that is future. All right? The main Bible sense is of a future kingdom. Now we have various references, references in other books. I'm going to quickly try to slide through this, but uh, I don't want to talk about all of them. But I am going to give them to you for your notes. And also I want you to notice a couple of things. In the book of Acts, which is primarily concerned with the acts of the apostles or the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles after the departure of Christ until Paul's captivity in Rome. All right, so it's about the development of the church. Now, interestingly, I found one indirect reference to Jesus as king in the book of Acts. Now, maybe there's some that I missed, but I found one, and that's an indirect reference. It's where Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he says, God has made him both Lord and Christ. Now, that title, Lord, refers to his authority. So, so does Christ, the anointed one. But it is interesting there the two titles are given here and there is a sort of an indirect reference to his kingship. But most of the book of Acts is focused on the development of the church, the spread of the gospel. If, if Very remarkably, in Acts chapter 20, when Paul is summing up his ministry to the Ephesian elders, there is reference to his preaching of the gospel. There is reference to keeping the people, protecting them from false teachers. But there is nothing said about Jesus as king. Now, Jesus is king. He's not denying that. I'm just saying that the book of Acts, the focus is not on the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, I only have four references. You can look at those uh, and uh, check out which ones those are. But the, the references are very few. There's none in Galatians. There's one in Ephesians, one in Philippians, one in Colossians. And uh, the, uh, probably the most prominent one is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10 where it says that at the knee of Jesus, uh, at the name of Jesus, what am I saying? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So that is 
clearly a reference to his kingship, but it is something that is future. Again, I want you to notice. Then we have some in Second Timothy, none in First and Second Thessalonians, none in First uh, Timothy, none in Titus, none in Philemon. There are some in First uh, in Second Timothy. To the King Eternal, he says in Second Timothy one seventeen, to uh, remember Jesus, the descendant of David, in Second Timothy two eight. We will also reign with him. Second Timothy two twelve. I charge you by God in Christ, by his appearing and kingdom, 2 Timothy 4.1. So those are the references. There are no references in uh, James. There are no references in First and Second Peter. There are no references in First, Second, and Third John. And there's none in Jude. There is some in Hebrews, perhaps. Notice, uh, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Uh, chapter 1, verse 3. There's a similar reference in chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, but these have more to do with the present spiritual aspect. And what I find in Hebrews is that Hebrews emphasizes the office of priest far more than the office of king. There are these three offices that Jesus occupies, prophet, priest, and king. But very, uh, uh, very much Hebrews is emphasizing the priesthood. There are a couple of other references that relate to his authority, to his kingship in the book of Hebrews. But the major emphasis of the book of Hebrews is on his priesthood. Uh, he talks about he is, a, he is the better sacrifice. He is the better priest. He serves in a better tabernacle. That's the whole emphasis of the book of Hebrews wrapped up in those statements. It is about his priesthood, not his kingship. All right, now... The other Gospels, you would think that perhaps we might find some there, and we do. But interestingly, interestingly, look at Mark. The very first reference in Mark is blind Bartimaeus. It's in chapter 10. So Mark goes through all the rest of Jesus' ministry, almost the end of chapter 10, before he brings up blind Bartimaeus, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, we talked about that term already. Talked about what Bartimaeus was saying. But it's, it is the first... Bartimaeus has this clear view of Jesus as king. He is probably the clearest view of anybody outside of the disciples of who Jesus is. And then we have the triumphal entry. We have all of these things. Uh, Jesus challenging the, uh, uh, the Pharisees. How is it that the Christ uh, is David's son and so forth. And then the trial. He says to the high priest, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of God. Uh, and that's the thing that convicts him. Then Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? Chapter 15, yes. And then Pilate says, do you want me to release the king? Of course, the, the soldiers mock him. There's the inscription. There's the mockers. Let the king of Israel come down. There's very parallel to Matthew. But interestingly, there is the one mention of Bartimaeus, and then there is all these references right at the end relating to the trial where Jesus declares himself, I am the king. And in an interesting way. It's quite interesting how it's done. Now, uh, Luke, pretty much the same thing, except there are two references right at the beginning in the announcement that Gabriel makes to Mary. Chapter 1, verse 32, Mary, the Lord will give him the throne of David. Right? Very clear reference there. And then in verse 33, he will reign forever. Jesus is the king. He's mentioned there as the king who will reign forever. And then we have, a, there's a, sort of an indirect reference when Jesus says the kingdom is in your midst in chapter 17 and then blind Bartimaeus again. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Interesting. Notice that. I told you to keep your mind on that. Jesus, or Matthew mentioned it. Mark mentioned it. Luke mentions it. John does not mention it. But all three of the first ones do. The reference, how is Christ David's son? There's a reference in the Olivet Discourse. And then the Jews to Pilate, we found this man saying he is Christ, a king. Pilate, are you a king? Jesus says, it is as you say. And then the inscription is mentioned again. So interesting, in these two Gospels, primarily the references to Jesus as king is blind Bartimaeus, and then those ones telescoped right at the end, or compacted right at the end, I guess. Maybe not telescoped is not the right word, but compacted right at the end there around the trial and the conviction and the hearing before Pilate where Jesus declares himself. Very interesting, isn't it? 
how this is all patterned out in the New Testament. And how many more there were in Matthew as he goes through his ministry. It's not that even in Matthew he is declaring it every second sentence. I only had 21 references that I found in the book of Matthew. But, it, the, the, but there are many more references in Matthew than there are in these other two Gospels. That is quite unique, I think. And then finally in John, after the feeding of the 5,000, they tried to force him to become king, and he rejected it. He, didn't, he avoided them. Then Paul, so Palm Sunday, which is mentioned in a couple of the other Gospels, but Hosanna, king of Israel, he's welcomed as the king. This sort of precipitates some of the trouble that he is going to face and go to the uh, uh, cross on. In the next, uh, later on in that chapter, there is an objection. We have heard that the Christ is to remain forever. So this is an indirect. It shows the messianic expectation of the king. They have the idea. Jesus, or David, the covenant with David said, oh, the, your son will live forever. He's going to reign forever. All right? So they have this idea, the Messiah must reign forever. And Jesus has been teaching them that the Son of Man is going to suffer. And they say, well, wait a minute, I thought the Son of Man is Christ. And, and yours, uh, we thought Christ was to live forever. So how, who is this Son of Man? Essentially, they are not getting what he is saying. They're not accepting what he's saying. It seems to con contradictory to their understanding, even though he is the King, and he is the Messiah, and he will suffer, as he told them. All right, now there's one more reference in the Gospel of John. We're going to pick that up at the end. But notice how most of the references to Jesus as the king in the Gospels occurs at the end of the Gospels, where he's declaring himself in the trial and, then, and in the mockery of unbelievers. And then also notice the faith of Bartimaeus repeated in all three synoptic Gospels, Jesus, son of David, that is really key. The blind man, saw, blind man saw and the seeing man did not see who Jesus is. So some applications now finally to the Christians in the present age. The vast majority of references to Jesus as king reference a future literal kingdom. So the first application we should take from this is that we should live in expectation of that kingdom. We're headed for that kingdom. It's coming. I, I'll be glad when it comes this world will be a much better place. But, the, but it is, we should live, we should live in preparing ourselves for that kingdom. That means we, we push, we, we lay aside the old man. We put on the new man. We walk with Christ. We obey Christ. We listen to the instructions of the New Testament. We try to think about our own lives and apply those things to our own lives. We try to take the pride and sin and selfishness and works of the flesh out of our own lives and be humble, quiet, faithful servants of God. That's what we're trying to do. So that's the kind of lifestyle we should be living. But there's another thing involved in this that I think that sometimes in the, in some circles of Christendom there's a real mistake being made. We should not try to impose the kingdom on this present age. We are citizens of a different country. There's a certain spirit out there that teaches that Christians ought to be doing everything they can to be imposing Christian values on the nation. Uh, there is a, a group, I don't know if it's a rising group, but there is a, at least they're making a lot of noise in the States called Christian nationalists. They are not, uh, I don't know how Christian they are, but they are, they are, they have the idea that they want to impose uh, Christian laws and Christian lawmakers on the land. They want to convert the land to a Christian uh, culture by law, by fiat, by the government uh, decree. There were some uh, people before them, back when I was going in school, they had... Uh, going to school, they had, uh, a, there was a bit of a movement, it was sort of a side fringe movement within Christianity, and uh, uh, they, they believed that it was the duty of the church to bring in the kingdom, and to uh, essentially to create a Christian culture. Some of the, uh, in the Middle Ages, some of the kings that converted supposedly to Christianity, uh, tried by their political power to enforce Christianity on their people. We're not pagans anymore, we're Christians. And they'd have mass baptisms and they'd impor, impose uh, you know, a Christianized 
uh, legal system on the nation. And uh, there were some things that were good that came out of that, but it, was, it did not succeed in making people Christians. That's the, that's the problem with it. Uh, and, the, and, and, and in fact, uh, it did not succeed in creating Christian nations. They still went to war with one another. They still uh, did uh, all the things that, that nations do. And so it was a massive failure. But even today, there are people who think that we should be somehow working uh, to reform our society. That's not what we're after. That's not the mission of the church. What we should be after is transforming the lives of individuals. We're not going to reform society. What, what we need to do is to transform individuals. We need to win them to Christ, uh, help them to be disciples, help them to walk with Christ, and to become uh, to become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that, was, that was the only thing that will change a nation if the people will be themselves changed. Um, I put in the notes, what would we think of the citizen of some other country who was living in our land who began to become an activist to try to impose the laws of his native country on our land? We, we wouldn't be too impressed, would we? You know, we're Canadians. We want to be run by Canadian traditions and Canadian laws. We're not going to live by the rules of some other country, uh, their way of life. We, we're going to live our own way of life, and we're not going to be too welcoming to those who want to impose their ways on our ways. And in the same way, uh, the, the world does not respond nicely to those Christians who are trying to achieve political power. That's not what we're about. Uh, we are evangelists, not activists. Now, <clears throat> the references to Christ, to Jesus as ruling at present, there are a few that do refer to that. They focus on the spiritual aspect of the kingdom where Christ rules over our spiritual lives. So in that sense, Jesus is the king. And we need to submit to his word in every aspect of our lives. We need to, we need to check our spirit. We need to check our attitudes. We need to check our way of life. We need to constantly be examining ourselves before the Lord and asking him to lead us. We especially need to submit to his words about kings and governments, submission to legitimate authority, ultimate allegiance to Jesus the King. That, that's how we should live. Uh, we're going to preach the gospel. We're not going to stop that, no matter what the government says. But we, but we're going. But we, we can't be rebels. Our testimony is ruined if we refuse to follow God's appointed leaders in our land. Well, those are just some thoughts from this. I hope it's very helpful to you. I do understand the emotion and spirit behind declaring Christ is king and Christ is my king. But the fact is that Christ is not yet king on the earth. That is coming. Uh, we need to let the Bible adjust our thinking on this and not the make the Bible adjust to our thinking. To close, I want to give you the one other record that is in John's Gospel, which is the most explicit answer of Jesus uh, given to Pilate. John eighteen thirty three to 37 Therefore Pilate entered into the praetorium, and he summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth, Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus is a king. He declared himself to be a king. But it was not the focus of his ministry. And in fact, he declares quite clearly right here that his ministry is, is spiritual, not political. He came to win people to the truth. He didn't come to impose his rule on the world. How are we going to come to the truth? By submitting to him. We're, we're, we don't, we don't uh, uh, bring about change in 
the lives of the people in the church by imposing a, 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 an authority structure on them. We do it by calling them to submit. That's the gospel. We're called to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope indeed that you do. His kingdom is not of this world in this age. Our duty in this age is to preach, not to rule. We are evangelists, not activists. And I hope you get the difference. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time tonight to go through this study. We don't really have enough time to develop it fully or thoroughly. But Lord, I pray that as we think about it, that it might be something that truly impacts our hearts and spirits as to how we live in our world. Help us to be evangelists, Lord, to be reaching out to the lost in our community, that they would hear the gospel and repent of their sins and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Amen.